Well, last couple of weeks we've been talking about the Bible way to get blessed. There's so many promises in the Bible, so many things in the Bible that that show us how we can get blessed if we just do them. And I want to start with uh, the scripture that we have been using as a basis. It's in Luke chapter 11, verse 28. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And we were talking about how to get blessed in just a very, very easy way. A lot of people are wondering, how can I make things go better for my life? Keep it according to the word of God. It ought, it's their automatics. Whatever God said, blessed, it means the favor of God, the hand of God. God's in it. He jumps into that thing, and that's it. You're blessed. It's an automatic. Jesus said, if you keep my word, okay, you'll be like an individual who planted, uh, who built a house upon a rock. And when the storms of life came and beat against the house, it, it stood the test. But if you build your house just on ungodly counsel or the ways of the world, it's like building on sand, and when the storms come, it falls apart. So in other words, if you keep God's word, after you hear it, it works. Today we're going to talk about a subject that's favorable to some, and some people unfavorable, and that is the whole idea of giving. Whether it's giving to God or giving to people, some people are just going to be stingy until Jesus comes back, but they're going to get into heaven because we're not saved by how much or how little we give. We're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. But we've got to go through this because this is a way that the Bible says, and God said it himself, that he'd be blessed. So we start with the famous scripture that we quote all the time because it's a promise in the Bible. And it's God said, test me in this. And it's found in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. And he was speaking this to the children of Israel about the concept and the principle of tithing. And tithing meant giving the first fruits of whatever your crops were, the first fruits of whatever blessings that God blesses you with, giving it back to God. Now we read this in verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out what? Such a blessing. Let's try it. And pour out such for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. And verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in your field, says the Lord of hosts. And what's this? Verse 12, and all nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. I mean, that's an automatic I mean, people, I hear people sometimes say, well, you know, that's in the Old Testament and tithing is not in the New Testament. The concept of tithing predates the law. It predates Moses. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek and Abraham wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile, just like you and I. But it doesn't matter if you think that, well, tithing was under the law. It was under the law. It was before the law and it was after the law because... We find that Jesus in the New Testament commended tithing. And we find some scriptures in there that show that the principle is still the same, even though we are not under the law. We are still under the principles of this principle that we find in Malachi chapter 3. But for those who really want to just say, well, Lord, I'm going to practice this law, God will say, well, then you'll be blessed too. Why? He never said this is going to end when I build the church. So therefore, if you want to grab hold of this, in fact, if you're not even a Christian, like the Roman centurion, he gave alms unto God. He blessed the nation of Israel. And what happens? He's the first Gentile to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and his family. If you take the word of God and just live by it, your life is blessed. Can you say amen? Now, some people might do this for selfish gain. There's a lot of people that give because they're just trying to get, like they're playing the stock market. This is not the stock market, but it is the word of God, and the Lord watches over his word to perform it. That's what he said, and we read that in the last couple of lessons that we taught on keeping the word of God after we hear it, and we're going to automatically bless, be blessed. Look at Matthew 23, verse uh, 23. For those who think that Jesus never talked about tithing, that's error. 
Because in, in Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe, tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. So a lot of people stop there and say, see, Jesus didn't commend tithing. No, he does. Because look at the next sentence. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he commended tithing. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, we see a direct parallel that the Apostle Paul is making between supporting Israel and the Levites and the whole Levitical priesthood, those who were doing the work of the ministry and the preachers of the, preachers of the gospel in the New Testament. Look what he says. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the what? Temple. And those who serve at the altar partake in the offerings of the altar. Even so, who? The Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. He's making a direct parallel. In other words, he said, well, we're not under the law. The principle is commended by Jesus saying, look, you don't want to be legalistic about it, but the whole point is in Israel, he had to have some kind of a structure to be able to govern all of the ministry that was in the tabernacle of Moses. And Jesus said, just the way that was done in the temple, well, when God, you know, when the Holy Spirit is going to come out pour and I'm going to build my church, I'm going to raise up apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they are going to equip the saints for the work of service. So therefore, it's in the same principle that tithing still is commended today. Now, you want to give more? You don't want to call it a tithe? Don't call it a tithe. I call it a tithe because I like Matthew chapter 3, and I'm holding on to that. I just stick on that one. I don't want to argue the point with anybody. I'm just going to say, I believe the Word of God because the Word of God says if I do this, I'm going to be blessed. And believe me, I've studied, this, I've studied the Scriptures. I know um, I, I studied accounting and a little bit of law. I'm not a lawyer, but I can tell you right now, that if Jesus was going to rescind it, okay, he would have put it in there, but he never did it because the principle remains in the New Testament. We're not under the legalism of doing that, and I do not believe you will be cursed if you don't tithe because we're in the New Covenant. But I don't believe, I mean, I do believe that you will not be as blessed if you don't follow these principles because by salvation is not by the law. It's by grace. Amen? By grace we are saved through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But a word to the wise should be sufficient. What about the tithe? What did God say about the tithe? This is what sews it up so beautifully that the tithe is for the work of the ministry and those in the ministry and to be able to take care of the house of God and all of the structure of the church and to pay all the bills and things like that. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30. Let's read this together on the count of three. One, two, three. And all of the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. In other words, it belongs to God. You say, well, he's talking about fruits and vegetables here. He's not going to put talking about the, the salary that I get. Back then, it was a barter system. There was no money system in the beginning of Israel. They started to go ahead and get the old shekels going after a while, but they were in the wilderness. They didn't have any time to be able to coin things. So an individual who worked was usually paid in chickens or cows or uh, turtle doves or whatever like that, or in wheat or barley or anything like that. That was the, the substance of the land back then. In the New Testament, we find, well, we're not, you know, we're not going down the block and, and buying live chickens or we're not paying, uh, you know, if we're, a, if we're working a job, you don't go there and, you know, guy's not going to give you a cow, okay, for a week's salary. That might not be bad, but you're not allowed to have cows, uh, you know, in, in, in town of Hempstead, as far as I know, okay? You can't have those. You can have a couple of rabbits. I think you might even be able to have some chickens, but that's about it. But I'm not, I'm not sure that you can go ahead and sell those things, okay, because of the environmental and board of health and everything else like that. But we get paid usually in dollars, American dollars, which that's an whole story. You know, the worth of a dollar has gone down so much, but I'm not going to talk about that. Praise the Lord. But the whole idea is that the tithe belonged to the Lord. It was his. In other words, 
He gives you 100% and he just asks you to give back 10%. And it's his. We'll get into the reason why God did that in a moment. In fact, we'll get into it right now. Well, in the nation of Israel, the purpose of the tithe we find is in Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. Let's read that together. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, the work of the ministry. The ministry of Jesus Christ is still continuing today in the church. I had a Jewish uh, rabbi friend of mine say, you know something? We need to get back to tithing like you Christians do. We do a lot, of, a lot better off. And I said, well, how do you fund the church? He goes, oh, we charge dues depending on the salary. And, and in fact, in this one temple, he said, we actually send bills out. We actually send a bill. And we basically find out if the guy's a chief surgeon and he's making $350,000, they expect a certain amount of dues. And then on the holy days, you've got to buy your seat. Okay? You actually literally have to buy your seat to get in on the holy days. Because that's when everybody shows up. It's like when Christians show up on Easter and Christmas. Okay, usually, you know, everybody just shows up twice a year that's not really practicing their religion. They go up on the super holy days, and the place is packed out. So that's a good time. They, he said that's a good time where we, we can really make the money to support the ministry. But we just practice what's in the Bible. We don't have chicken dinners here to go ahead and raise money. We have chicken dinners because we like chicken. Okay. When we have a feast here, it's not to raise money. It's because we like to fellowship with one another. Amen? Praise God. But we don't have bingo here. Okay? Not that I'm against bingo. Bingo's legal. Okay? And it might be fun. You know, but we're not doing bingo here. Okay? To raise funds. Why? Because God never said, you know, start a bingo thing and I'll bless you. But God said, if you do what I said in the Word of God, I'll jump in on that because... My words remain forever. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Let's read that one together. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. The first fruits was always the tithe, 10%. So your barns will be what? Filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. In other words, whatever you do, whatever you're producing to sell or whatever, you're going to get blessed. It's just in the Bible. Someone said to me, well, why would God do that? I feel that we should give whatever we want to give to the work of the ministry today. Well, if that's the case, go to your employer and say, you know what? I want to do a new thing. I'm just going to say, pay me whatever you want to pay me. I can guarantee you the salaries will go lower and lower and lower. It doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. You can't work that way. Why? Because everything is tied to expenses. In accounting, it's very simple. You've got revenue and you've got expenses. If your expenses exceed your revenue, okay, you're in the red. If your revenue exceeds the expenses, you're in the black. In other words, you're doing okay. Say amen. How many people would rather have more revenue than expenses? Raise your hand. How many people have more expenses than revenue? Don't raise your hand, okay? Because in America... This is the land of the debtor and the creditor. And again, I said I would teach this, and we're going to do a seminar in September. And I've got a five-year plan I'm going to work out to get you people out of credit card debt, all free of charge. Because God doesn't want you to be a slave to a lender. The Bible says that the debtor is a slave to the lender. In fact, you're going to reverse things that after five years, you will be getting interest on your own money and you'll be your own banker. How many people have maybe a $3,000 credit line? Raise your hand. Okay, $3,000. Okay. Now, if you've been doing this for a while, you know, they might up it a lot. My credit lines are unbelievable. You know why? I don't have any. I don't have any debt. And they're always trying to get me to go ahead and get 10,000, 15,000. I get phone calls every Monday. Congratulations. Your score entitles you to, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I don't even talk to them anymore. I hit the, do, you know, the reject button as soon as it comes up. But I used to counsel 
especially those on the phone. You know, you get somebody on the phone, they want to tell you, hey, listen, we have a great, great plan. You have such a great credit rating. We would like to give you. I said, hold it. I said, I don't need anything. I said, why? I said, why should I? And I asked him, what's your, what's your interest rate? Well, you would start out with 12.99. That's pretty good today, okay? It's 12.99. I said, are you kidding me? I said, I tell you what. I will loan you money, okay, if you give me 9.99. They go, wow. I said, do you have a credit card? Yeah, with this company. What do you have? Well, I have like 15.99. I said, tell you what. I'll loan you money for 9.99%. They go, Wow, I don't know if I can do this on the phone like this. I said, why should I give you 12.99%? I said, hey, can I, can I borrow money from you on the private? I'm not a rich man. I'm not rich at all. But I learned the value of a dollar, and I realized that so many people spend more than it's coming in. God wants you to get onto a track where his financial track puts you in a place where you are in control, and no one else is making you a slave to a lender somewhere. So anyhow, we'll talk about that more in September, but let's get back to these blessings that God gives. So in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions and with your first fruits of all your increase, so your bonds will be filled with plenty and your vats will flow, overflow with new wine. Jess is in charge of the checkbook. Billy Graham once said, he said, show me a man or a woman's checkbook and I'll show you where their heart is. Not all the time because we've got to pay mortgages and nobody likes paying mortgages and, and all kinds of bills like that. But when it comes to all the other things, all the uh, expendable items that some of us have a lot of that we don't really need it, but we like it and we want it. And of course, one of the first laws in economics is what? Man's wants are insatiable. That's one of the first laws. It's in chapter one, usually, of economic books. Maybe they've expanded them in the last 30 years, but the one I took, that was the first thing I saw. And all of a sudden, they got the idea, the, the wants in italics, and there's a little note underneath it. And it's saying, his wants are insatiable. And that's one of the basic principles of economics. It drives the supply of uh, the, the law of supply and demand, which is kind of like the next one. His wants, not his needs, but his wants are insatiable. The, eye, the Bible says the eye is never satisfied with what? Seeing. We always want. The grass always looks greener on the other side. doesn't mean it is, but we want it. And the whole idea of credit cards is to get you to be able to be consumed by your wants to the place where you just take this supposable free money. And they know that once they get the credit card up all the way to the max, they're not going to give you any more credit. And they're hoping that you don't pay the monthly payment. Why? Because there's a massive penalty. To me, it's another form of just selling a drug. And what they do is you run the credit cards up to the place where they're all filled again. So where are you at? You're not making anything on it. You can't even use it anymore, but you've got to pay the minimum payment, which Congress did pass a new law now that says that it can't just be interest only. Then they'd have you a slave for the rest of your life. You got a $3,000 de debt, and your interest only is the only thing you're paying. You're never paying down the principal. That's the whole thing. But because of the debt crisis we had, Congress had to do something, and they said, you can't do this no more. Bankers you're going to have to cut back. You're going to have to make them pay a little bit more of the principal along with the interest. And usually, the interest is much more than the principal. You can pay more if you want, but usually, by the end of the month, you see something else you want, and you buy it, you get it back up. So you're constantly doing that. I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to make it so that in five years, you'll be able to go ahead, and you will have your own two or $3,000 credit line and when you want something, not necessarily needed, but when you want something, you'll borrow from yourself, but you're going to pay interest to yourself. You can give yourself a good rate, less than 24.99%, which a lot of you young people are paying. You might charge yourself only 10%. You're still making money. It's going into your bank account rather than 
BOA or any other bank, Citibank or MasterCard or whatever like that. Amen? We'll talk about that more. Kind of wet your whistle for this. But why would I do this? Because God told me to do it because he said so many of my people are slaves to lenders that they can't even function and pay their debts. But the first thing God says is get on God's financial plan first. Jess automatically takes care of that. Every time we get any kind of a check in, boom, 10% off the top, we don't question it at all. You want to pay off the gross or you want to pay off the net? That's between you and God. That's a personal thing. You know, we just say, just make it easy, 10%, boom, that's it. And guess what? We don't have, do we, we have credit cards up the gazoots, but there's nothing on them. The credit card companies hate us. They're not making any money, so they charge us a lot, a $40 fee sometimes. Although there's a ways around that because we get the BJ's card, and so there's all kinds of different ways of doing these things. But we pay it off the end of the month, and don't miss a payment because that's how they nail you. Because if they give you a 12.99%, and they say, and if you miss one payment, we are not under obligation, but we choose to bring you up to the highest, which would be 24.99. And guess what? They know your record. They just look at your credit score. And your credit score doesn't just show the big number. It shows your methods of payments and who you relate to. And these predator lenders go, whoa, we got this person, man. We'll give them a great rate. And we'll suck them in. And they'll transfer to us. But we already know. They're always late. So we'll bounce it up to 24.99%. Give them a 4.99%. What's the difference? We know they're going to blow it. And the next month, boom, it'll be raised to 24.99%. That is what's going on. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Well, let's get back to God. God doesn't do this with you. He promises something in the Bible. He says, you give him 10%, you can keep your 90%, and he never has raised it over thousands of years. The percentage has stayed the same. Have you ever noticed that the taxes never go down? When they say they go down, they're raising it on something else. Some people say, well, my tax base is not bad. You know, my federal tax, you know, I'm only paying 15-something percent. You don't make a lot of money. I'm only paying 15 percent, you know, federal tax. And then what about state tax? What about local tax? And then, of course, how the local governments get away with it is they don't call them taxes. They call them fees. Anybody a fisherman here in New York State? You want to fish in the uh, waters of New York State? You have to pay a fishing license fee. That's what you got to do. They tried to do a saltwater license. Too many people complained, so they rescinded that. But they got all kinds of fees. They got fees for licenses for, to drive a car. I mean, what does the motor vehicle really do for you except give you a license? Do they do anything? Do they find you a job? Do they help you find a car? No. What do they do? And then when you buy a car, not only do you have to pay a fee to be able to license the car, but you've got to pay sales tax on the purchase of the car. But how they do this is they just diversify it, so call out so many different names. God never changed the amount. In fact, in the New Covenant, he says, hey, you want to give 10%, you'll be blessed because that was the minimum of the law. But you can give whatever you want to if you're giving from your heart. But if you're not giving from your heart, God says, I don't even want it anyhow because you're not under the law. And that's the key. So the spirit in which you give is what's extremely important, not the legalistic thing that the nation of Israel was under. Because you give that way, God loves a cheerful giver, not a grumpy giver. But then again, is God really first in your life? Billy Graham said this in uh, his column in the Kansas City Star. He reminded people that everything they have, including their money, is a gift from God. He said this, quote, We can't take credit for it, nor should we use it selfishly or thoughtlessly. Instead, we should seek to use it wisely and for God's glory. When we give to God's work, we are only returning to him a portion, that is the tithe, of what he has already given us. And then some other scriptures here. Matthew 6, verses 31 to 33. 
This is the principle by which we should live our lives. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. And who's a Gentile? Anyone that wasn't Jewish. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Notice he didn't say your heavenly Father knows you want all these things. You have to separate needs and wants, especially when you're doing budgeting. You've got to put things in priority order. Okay? A new television set is not a priority if you have three flat tires and you need the car to go to work. We'll talk about that at another date. But God says that he knows your needs. And then verse 33 is what I've lived my life on since I became a Christian. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What? Boy, man, that's, that's a promise. Seek first this kingdom. In other words, how do I seek the kingdom of God first? Well, I find out what a Christian should be like, and I just do it. I just practice being a Christian, number one. A Christian doesn't live this life alone apart from the body of Christ. We're all members one of another. Christians practice charity. It's more blessed to give than receive. We're going to read that in a moment. So therefore, we honor the Lord with the first fruits. Then we also concerned about the poor. We've turned taking care of the poor over to the government and created ghettos. Whereas before, the government took care of that. You know what? We took care of each other. The churches were responsible and we did a good job in the areas of taking care of the poor. If you go back to history, you can see that. Why? Because it is basic fundamental principle in the heart of of Christ and his church to remember the poor. And when you see your brother or your sister in need, to take care of them. The government doesn't do a good job. They send them a welfare check or they give them some food stamps and they keep them on the plantation, so to speak. Because you don't get out of that because they don't raise the rates that much. And they took away the idea of having more than one child and you get a lot of extra money. They did away with that. So that's not an incentive anymore. So we have pockets of poverty where the government promises so much. But in reality, what are they really doing for you? But in God, we truly care about one another. We're supposed to truly care, and we did. What do we do without welfare, without the government subsidies and everything else like that? None of this stuff started until the 1900s. Up until then, the churches reached out. Now, there's still churches that are reaching out, but the government has taken away so much of the responsibility of the church that it's just not a big issue anymore. And the number one reason for that is because it's become nothing but an administrative thing where they can hire a lot of people to be able to do a little bit of work, whereas most of the taking care of the poor in the churches up till the 1900s was done by volunteers because the scripture says the Lord loves a cheerful giver and it's better to give than to receive. Say amen if you're with me on that. Two more scriptures. Well, yeah. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus that he said it is more what? Blessed to give. Give, then receive. I want to ask you something. How do you, how do you do your handling your tipping? If you're not giving the bare minimum of 15% on a tip, don't leave a track, okay, and try to witness to them. I don't give a 15% tip. Sometimes they make out really well because I don't have any change. And I say, ah, they're going to get blessed this time. Kind of all works out. But I try to give 20% minimum. That's even if it was a terrible, terrible waiter or waitress. They still got to eat. They might be new at it. They might have had a bad day. Now, if they're ornery, I'll just let them know. But I never really met, uh, you know, a, a um, I don't know what I was going to call wicked, but, you know, somebody who's just angry. I would say, you know, what are you doing this? You know, I say, I got a better job for you. You know what you should become? You should become a, an individual who works for Macy's in the complaint department. 
because you're just like them. Remember, you're supposed to be serving me. I'm wondering what you're doing to the food before I get it. Mm. I'm not even going to get into those things. That's why many of you are sick and weak. You eat out too much. Praise God. At least you don't know where you're eating. Praise God. But anyhow, so here, Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21, and we're going to close with this scripture. This is the greatest advice that I can offer you today on how to be blessed. Be a giver. Be a cheerful giver. Not just your tithes and your offerings, but remember the poor. Find somebody less fortunate than yourself. Give anonymously. You can do it through me you can, in the church, or you can just do it through someone else. Or if you don't know many, it don't matter. Just go up and say, listen, I'd like to bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I felt you could use this. Well, you've got to find out whether they're a Christian first. No, first, if you're taking care of your own. The Bible says, he that doesn't provide for his own is worse than an infidel. So you take care of your own. But then you say, hey, it's more blessed to give than receive. So, hey, I want to get that bank account in heaven going. Because God writes down every single charitable act that you do. It's in there. He that gives to the poor, the Old Testament, lends to the Lord who pays back tremendously. Who gives to the poor? You're lending to the Lord. Why? You're doing the Lord's work because we are his hands. We are his feet. So when we care about the poor and we give, we get blessed. Not only that, you feel good. How many people ever gave something to somebody and just said, wow, I just feel good? That's okay. Because when you do good, you. When you do bad, you. We're back to kindergarten. You do good deeds, you're going to feel good. If you're a Christian who's grumpy all the time, you know what? Give of your life more. Because you're like the Dead Sea. Everything's coming in, nothing's going out. That's the cure for it. We all learn these the hard way. When I first got, became a Christian, I was a little stingy, I have to admit it. It really was. Because being a businessman, it's like, hey, you know, time is money. Really. You can work for $10 an hour, $20 an hour, $30 an hour, or $50 an hour. So if you're going to look for a career and you want to just make $10 an hour and you don't care, okay, fine. But if you want to make $50 an hour, you've got to go to the occupational handbook in, in, in every library and find out exactly what careers pay like $50 an hour. How about $100 an hour? That'd be nice. Gee, you know what? I think I'm going to go work in the car wash down the block. They're going to pay me $100 an hour. No, they're not. You'd be blessed if you made $10 an hour there. And that's for the supervisor. But if you own the car wash, that's a different story. Well, how do I own it? Well, that's not the subject of today. But I can tell you this. If you follow the advice that Jesus gives, you will never be doing without end. You'll be storing up treasure in heaven. Look at what it says here. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moth and the rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For what? Let's say that last one together. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. Wherever your treasure is, there's your heart. If you treasure porn, there's where your heart is. No wonder your wife is wondering what in the world you're doing. Why did I just say that? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe the Holy Ghost wanted to get an advertisement in for men to stop looking at that. And if you're a lady... And you're getting tired of your husband, maybe you should stop looking at that stuff too. That's just an advertisement. Is it okay if I tell the truth? You see, the danger with a pastor who just speaks by the Spirit is that when the Spirit of God wants to say th something and he wants to advertise something, and you know, like, you know, I'm going to just do a public service announcement. That's all from heaven. But where's your treasure? Whatever you treasure, if you treasure money, well, there's your heart. If you treasure God, well, there's your heart. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. This is just promises. Now, next week, next week, we're going to still stay with this getting blessed the Bible way, and we're going to be dealing with how to be able to be blessed by not yielding to temptations that come our way. We shift gears and go into the subject of temptation. We're going to look at the anatomy of sin. We're going to look at the constructs. We're going to break it down. Even maybe Daniel will be able to write a uh, code 
program for this to show how this happens, a flow chart to see. And maybe if you see that a little bit more, you say, hey, you know what? I don't want to be ignorant of the devil's devices. I want to understand how can temptation can rise up within me and cause me to shipwreck or cause me to just say, darn, I gave in again. We're going to break it down and see that the Bible says that we can be blessed if we follow God's way of dealing with temptation. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and we're going to close in prayer. We'll go eat some bagels and have some coffee, except for me, I can't eat anything today. Praise the Lord, but I can have my cup of coffee. Let's bow our hearts and pray right now. Everyone say amen if you appreciate the word of God today. Is that all right? Amen. It's in the Bible. Let's get blessed. Follow God's word. We get blessed in everything. Find somebody today. Here's an advertisement the Holy Ghost is saying. Find somebody less fortunate than yourself today. And just go up to them. They're all over the place. Find somebody and just here. I'd like to bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you walk away, I'm going to guarantee you're going to feel good. Don't worry about what the individual is going to do with it. Your blessing comes from giving, not worrying about what they're going to do with it. Of course, don't go up to a drug addict and give them it. But, I, you know, you don't know whether or not somebody that's down and out is a drug addict or not. Don't ask questions. But bless the person. And God's word, you get this chain going, and you start investing in heaven. And God's word just pays dividends like unbelievable. It just starts going up and storing in heaven. Let's drive the angels crazy having to write all these blessings down. Oh, my gosh, look what they gave. Oh, they gave this to some poor person. Oh, they went and, by the way, it's not only money. It's time. Go visit someone in the hospital. Or you don't know anybody in the hospital. Go up to the hospital. Look for somebody laying in bed. Go up to the terminal wing, and you'll see people laying there. Nobody even goes to see them. They're just laying there. Just go up there and bless that person. And watch and see what God would do for your life. Wow, look what that person did. These arms are going to go up and store up treasure in heaven. Amen? Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, by your word, I am blessed. I want to be those, one of those, who have heard the word of God and will keep it. Because I know that I'll be blessed hearing the word of God and keeping it. Help me, Jesus, to store up treasures in heaven where nothing down here can steal or destroy it. For I want my treasure and my heart to be hid with Christ in God. Amen. And amen.